Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a much anticipated project update video for the 1-6 scale ArmorTech German King Tiger Heavy Tank. Since the last video, the rear area here is going through its sealing up procedure and as you can see, the rear section is fleshing out very nicely with its detail fittings and components. In this video, I'm going to be going over all of the detail accessories that went into this section here, bring it up to this condition, as well as also describing some of the modification work that goes into the stock kit supply parts in order to improve them further, again, bringing them up to the condition that you see in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of content coming right at you. To start this video off, here we have a majority of the components that comprise of the rear engine deck area of the model. What you see here are the kit supply components, or I should say it's most of them. There are a couple parts that aren't present on the table, but the kit, of course, gives them to you. Obviously, these parts are a bit large, so in order to get a better idea of what the parts actually look like, let me go ahead and bring the camera in closer. So starting from left and working our way to the right takes us to these four plates here. These plates here are used to cover up the radiator details and fittings that I touched upon in the previous videos. Of course this system here is basically identical to what you'll see on other later generation German World War II tanks such as the Panther and of course the same is true for some of the other paper Panzers that are out there like the E series. But back to the King Tiger here, just like with the Panther the fan area are protected with these plates and they are cut in half. The components that are supplied with the ArmorTech kit are made from about a quarter of an inch thick aluminum alloy plate. They are laser, or I should say water jetted to shape, and then are CNC'd with their countersinks in the various locations. The one on this plate over here has some extra turnings that are made in order to facilitate the antenna well and also some of the other antenna plate cover details which are going to be mentioned as the video goes on. This large plate that we have here that I already pre-primed with red primer is the underplate and this here is designed to act as the backbone and is really what all of these components are going to attach to. Unlike the other ones which are made out of aluminum alloy, this one here is actually made from steel so it's got some heft to it. The piece is fully perforated so that all of the fastener locations appropriately line up and then you could flesh out everything that goes on the top portion of this. In addition to acting as the backbone, this also acts as the main engine hatch stop, which you'll see once I pan the camera over, which takes us directly to this plate over here. We'll circle back and go over these details momentarily. This plate is the main top engine deck plate, which is going to be visible once the model is finished. Just like with those fan cover plates, it's made out of the same quarter inch aluminum alloy and has the exact same type of machining quality press and which needless to say is actually pretty good. The way the unit is designed is that this part here would be affixed to the tank and then this part here would simply bolt directly to it. Once the unit lines up you can see that the hole found on the steel is slightly smaller compared to the hole present that's on the main engine deck and this is to prevent the engine hatch which is kit supplied to fall directly into the engine bay and it gives you the appropriate little recess here which would be present on the actual vehicle. As for the main engine hatch currently that's not on the table but there's really nothing much to talk about. It is a quarter of an inch aluminum plate just like the one that we have here but obviously it's meant to fit into this recess that we have present. On top of that we have several other locations for the mounting of hinges and the hinges are basic ArmorTech CNC aluminum hinges. The hinges do work and they are a good design however we'll be circling back on that once I'm done going over the kit supply parts and trust me you're gonna want to stay tuned for that. So circling back to the other components that I mentioned here we have the rear breather which is this CNC turning that we have here and that's going to be affixed in this location. This component like I touched upon in a couple videos ago when I hinted at these pieces here is actually a really nicely designed piece. I like the way ArmorTech designed this part and I also like the external detailing that are present. The piece has the appropriate shape as well as the 
little wells over here for the fasteners to be sunk into this section. The only thing that is absent is the little screen mesh which would be found in this area over here to prevent foreign particular from entering inside of the engine compartment. Obviously that would be something that wouldn't be that great. The other thing that is absent is another bit of detailing that I am going to be circling back to and again stay tuned for that. Another kit supply component is this piece that we have here which is one of the fluid cover caps. It goes on this portion here of the rear engine deck which as you can see is a very large hole and the piece just plugs directly into place and then you just adhere it on with some adhesives and call it a day. The piece does have the overall correct geometry and scale to it however it's a bit plain in terms of external detailing as you can notice. The piece is a solid CNC aluminum turning and in the past I actually did recycle this on my own personal King Tiger project that I built all those years ago where I go ahead and improve it somewhat but again yeah, as you guess it, more information on that is to come. The next thing to mention are what's in this bag over here. And this aluminum CNC turning is the air intake for the engine hatch. There's two of them. It would be in this type of lo location over here. The piece itself is very basic. Has the overall correct shape. It has a hole in the center portion over there for the insertion of the fastener. And, you know, once you secure it to the kit supplied engine deck, you can call it a day. However, this is not going to be utilized on this build, and you'll see why momentarily. If you've already seen the other previous video, you know exactly why. But continuing on takes us to the grill work. And this is something that is going to be recycled on this build, and I'm not just going to be straight up replacing, but I will be tweaking them somewhat, and you'll see what that looks like later on. This here is the main radiator air intake grills just like on the panther there are four of them and like on the panther g they are identical to one another on the king tiger and the piece is made from a single cnc aluminum turning the piece is actually really nicely designed like i said before there's no real reason to straight up replace these but some modifications are going to be made to them that of course i am going to be going over in more depth but the piece you can see has definitely the look shape and feel of the king tiger's grill work. Also, one thing that I like about the Armor Tech kit is how thick the piece is. These grills on these German tanks are very, very, you know, thick in their appearance. This is a bit misleading if you look at a lot of static models out there where, you know, they just render it, you know, as a thin little piece. But if you ever had the opportunity to see a real King Tiger or a Panther for that matter, and you look into the engine grills, these things just, keep, it looks like they just descend down, you know, a couple feet. So the fact that Armor Tech went ahead and made this nice and thick is actually a positive that the kit does have. On their Tiger 1s, for instance, uh, in order, they tend to make these a bit on the thinner side, or at least they did on their previous releases, and I would always have to add thickeners to them. But for the King Tiger here, that's just not going to be necessary. So definitely kudos on that. The next thing we have are the fan covers, and the fan covers are also nicely rendered overall. They have the correct shape. I believe even the grid pattern here it has the correct amount of, of uh, spokes on it, and obviously it does have the look and feel of the King Tiger's fan guards. There are going to be some mods made to this one too, but again, you're going to have to wait and see how exactly that pans out. And of course, this being an ECA video, you can expect that there's going to be a lot of modifications and replacements for the components that I just mentioned. So that leads us to this part that we have here. Like I touched upon before, this part is actually really nicely rendered with the out-of-the-box configuration from ArmorTech, and it will be recycled on this build. And on top of that, there's going to be hardly any modifications made to this particular piece specifically. What I am going to do is I'm going to add upon it. So the first thing I want to mention is the center here where we have this hole. On the real King Tiger, there would be some mesh work found in this area to prevent some foreign objects from entering into the engine compartment or more specifically into the air intake which is found on the rear section of the engine compartment and I go over that in a little bit more depth in the previous videos. So that's something that is going to be fabricated with some varmint mesh and also maybe a little bit of a retention ring just to keep it in place. However, the the other addition that I'm going to make to this piece involves what's going to be added to the top of it. In addition to the grill work, there was another device that was designed in order to protect this area from other types of damage, namely from air bursting munitions or possibly just from airplane machine gun fire. And that was this very large and thick guard, which would have been located in this section over here. 
that guard is not present on the stock armor tech kit however this is something that is not necessarily a must-have component as there are some examples of king tigers out there that did not have that piece fitted or at least from several of the examples i have seen regardless for this build here i wanted to go ahead and have the model rendered with that component fitted in place so i went ahead and designed this component right here this item here is a new addition to the ECA King Tiger catalog and it is a 3D printed drop in replacement or I should say a drop in add on for the stock armor tech piece. This component here is a pre-production sample however the actual production units utilize the exact same file that produced this component but the material is that white nylon material that is seen on several of the other ECA components. However the piece is still dimensionally exactly the same with the way this piece works is that it is designed to be a drop-in fit onto the armor tech component as you can clearly see once this component is dropped in place the only thing the builder's got to do is just secure to the top deck with some longer fasteners that are going to be mounted in this section over here once the piece is fitted you could see how that air intake is thoroughly protected from any sort of rounds shrapnel or anything that can be thrown into this area that can go into the engine bay and for the rest of the tanks ventilation system for that matter that's really all there is to mention about this component over here although i am going to clean it up somewhat because of the printing method that was used for this part there are some print lines present i'm just going to polish them down with some of the techniques that i've touched upon in the other videos but that's really all there is for that the next thing to mention are the filler caps so here's one of the two filler caps that are supplied with the kit. The other one isn't present on the table right now, but basically looks almost identical to this one over here, albeit with slightly different geometry on the sides, which is as true to form on the real unit. Like I stated before, in the past I would actually recycle this component by tweaking it slightly from the stock configuration and giving it the details that are absent on the stock unit. Basically, the two ways to improve upon it are to add a slit line right over here where this disc makes contact with the tapered section and also to add a fastener detailing right here in the center. You see on the real King Tiger, and it's also again true for the Panther, this is how you get access to the fuel system and also to top off the radiators. And the way we, or the way that's done is that this disc is actually removable and it's a hatch. And to get access to the inside, there's a fastener on the outside, which is actually a lock where you take a wrench, you rotate it loose, it unlocks the unit and the whole top portion can pop off. Well, you know, on my past builds, since they didn't have any interior details or anything, I just simply just, you know, modified the kit one. However, as anyone who watches the series knows, this build here that these pieces are gonna go on have a fully rendered out and detailed engine compartment. Obviously, it would be pretty anticlimactic to go through all of that work fleshing out the engine compartment area, only to cover it up with some of these fittings over here, sealing off the inside till the end of time. So, for this build, I went ahead and wanted to alleviate that, and by doing so, I'm not going to be using these kit ones. In fact, I went ahead and did the next best thing, which was to tool up brand new replacements. So here we have the kit one and here we have the 3D printed counterpart. Both of these pieces here are offered on the ECA catalog and as you can see are made out of 3D printings. The printing is that white nylon material and the piece that you see here are the actual production units. The component compared to the ECA one has similar geometry to it. We also have integral printed on weld beads so that's one less thing that the builder needs to worry about. And what's more important though, is you'll notice that unlike this one where it's a solid CNC turning, the printed one here is hollow. And it's hollow because the cap here is fully functional, or at least that's the idea. We'll see how that pans out once I build the thing. But in addition to the, the piece being functional, you can also see the inner geometry here is as per the real unit. I took a bit of time trying to study the real examples of King Tigers that have this piece off and with that information in hand was how I cobbled up this component that we have here. So in addition to the inside geometry, we also have some of the locks, or I should say the guides that are found on the top portion, which are these two little lugs. And you'll see how they 
mate on the inner portion of the hatch once I free it from the sprue. In addition to the hatch, you can also see the locking mechanism that is present and all of the components that are needed to make the unit function are supplied on the printed runner. The same is true for not just this filler cap, but also for the secondary filler cap as well. And just like with the other filler cap, you can see that has the inner geometry detailing to it, as well as those other fittings I touched upon before. The two pieces, by the way, are different with the way the interior sections are, and this, is, again, was lifted directly off of the real example of a King Tiger that I was studying. The other thing to mention is that these pieces are designed to be a direct re replacement for the armor tech ones. So you'll see that they have this tower descending from the bottom portion here, and this is to plug into the section that's found on the armor tech kit. So no other adjustments really need to be made to the rear plate. You just don't use this one, and you just drop this one in place, and you'll have all of the benefits that I just mentioned. So these are going to be entering into their assembly momentarily. But before I do, let's go ahead and continue with some of the new replacement fittings. The next thing to mention are these hooks that we have here. If anyone has ever built a King Tiger or a Panther before, you'll know that the rear hatch, or I should say the rear engine deck area, is cluttered with tons and tons of small little hooks. And if anyone's ever built a 135th scale one, you'll know the pain that I'm going to be referring to because trying to remove those pieces off of the sprue, get them cleaned up, and then get them fitted onto the model is probably the hardest part on one of those type of builds. At worst, they fling off the Lost Party and then you're basically screwed, or at, at best, they'll stick to the tweezer or your finger when you're trying to secure them to the model. So it's always a trying experience, shall we say, on a smaller scale Panther. But in the larger scale, the Armor Tech Kit doesn't even supply you with these components, so these are just going to be used to enhance the stock area on the vehicle. The ECA set's made out of the white nylon 3D print, as I touched upon before, and of course is listed on the ECA catalog. The set supplies you with three patterns of hooks, and these sets here can be used on not just the King Tiger, but also the Panther as well, if I'm not mistaken. Starting with the largest hook, this one here is for the rear engine cover plate area, and with these hooks, this is how you actually remove that plate to get access to the Maybach engine underneath. The second pattern are these hooks over here, and these are positioned around the fan cover plates area, and again, that's how you're able to remove the plates to get access to the, well, radiators. The final hooks are these ones over here, and these are actually mounted on the bow of the vehicle and are found on the hatch plate area. And again, you need to remove that hatch plate to get access to the tank's transmission. So you can see how these details here are pretty important. Also, all of the components have their well beads integrally printed on. And this is something that honestly, I wish I had really badly on some previous builds, where in the past, although these parts are hard in 135th scale because of the flinging nature of them, in 1 6 scale, it's not really that much of a of a change because, yeah, you don't have, yeah, the parts are bigger so they're easier to glue in place. However, before this set over here, each and every one of these pieces had to have been scratch built independently and I had to have them all match the exact same shape, the exact same contour. And then afterwards, once they're fitted in place, I had to go ahead and sculpt the well beads, which doesn't sound like a lot of work, but... Yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty meticulous task at hand. So this set here really does save a lot of time. One last thing I want to mention about these sets is that you'll notice that there are more than enough hooks of each pattern supplied than are needed on the model. This is to just act as an insurance policy because, you know, things can happen. Parts can either fling off the lost party out, get misplaced, or you might accidentally break one with a mishap or two. And if that were to happen, you're not going to be completely screwed because you have several examples of each of these hooks present on the sprue here. So with one sprue here, you not only have enough for the model, but you also have enough in case of a rainy day problem. And literally straight from the printer are some more new detail parts that are so new, I haven't even announced them yet on the Facebook page. And on top of that, they haven't, or I should say, at the time of filming, they haven't been added to the catalog, but are going to be shortly after the time this video drops. And that's what we have in this bag right here. So, 
one component, or I should say one set of details that I've had on the ECA catalog now for about 10 years, that's for the King Tiger specifically, are the breather valves that are found on the rear portion of the engine deck. As for what they are, I'll touch upon that in more depth as the video goes on, but basically I made these components in resin years ago, and they've been in constant production ever since. Well, the molds are getting kind of old now, and just like with many of the other components on the catalog that are aging, I went ahead and phased them out with new 3D printed replacements. And here we have the first look of the new replacements right here. These here are the new ECA breather valves. These ones here are pre-production prototypes. However, the production units are gonna be made out of the HD 3D print material that have been mentioned on several of the videos. But the quality of the parts are almost identical, if not better than the old school resin ones. And it's about time the old resin ones can now be put out the pasture. Also, if anyone have outstanding orders on the old school resin ones, the sets have been automatically replaced for no extra charge with these new 3D printed ones here, but this is only for the people who ordered the old school resin ones that are currently on the catalog. Once this video drops, those old resin ones are going to be out of production, scrubbed off the listings, and these ones here will replace them. As you can see, they have the exact same type of feature on them where the section is ready for the rods, or I should say the tube work to be put in place. And there are four of them on the King Tiger. And this one here will be receiving the same type of detailing. And as for what these pieces are, again, we'll touch upon that later on once they get fitted to the model. The other thing to mention that I have designed, or I designed myself I should say, these components that we have here. What are these you may ask? Well, simply put, these are the mesh covers for the engine grills. Of course, the King Tiger has these large intakes found on the back for the radiator, just like the Tiger One did. And just like on that vehicle, well, it was deemed to be a weakness on the vehicle because a Molotov cocktail or a hand grenade or any sort of unpleasantness can be thrown into that section over there and basically screw up the whole vehicle. Well, the Germans went ahead and designed mesh covers that go over those areas over there, restricting the hole so that large objects cannot be thrown inside. And in order to keep the mesh in place, there would have been a little framework that secures on top of the grill work and it protects or it, and it keeps the frame or I should say it keeps the mesh work in place and prevents it from moving around. And that's what we have over here. If anyone has ever built a smaller scale King Tiger or Panther, you'll recognize these pieces because usually they're made out of photo etch. However, in one stick scale, photo etch is not exactly a viable material for this per se, specifically if it's just a flat plate like it is on the smaller ones as you need to have some three dimensions to it because you actually have to hold the piece in place. So these pieces here are a new, are going to be a new addition to the ECA catalog. These ones again are made out of the prototype material. The actual production ones will be the standard nylon. As for how they get fitted in place, you can see one of the Armatech grills over here. And this unit just drops directly over it in this manner. Of course, the four fastener holes that are used to keep this unit mounted to the engine deck are gonna be serving double duty to sandwich the grill work mesh covers in this area. The mesh is not present right now, but the mesh work will be included with the ECA set. So you have everything you need to go ahead and get the piece affixed with the appropriate detailing. More information on this, of course, is to come in this video. So you stay tuned for that. So with all of those other details out of the way, this now brings us to probably one of the most important batch of parts that are going to be mentioned in this video, and probably it's one of the most important detail parts I designed for the entire King Tiger, which is actually pretty noteworthy because I've went ahead and throughout the course of the series designed some really interesting and pretty elaborate components to hop up the Armor Tech kit, and that involves, of course, none other than the engine hatch. As I touched upon earlier in the video, the engine hatch that's supplied with the kit Sadly, I can't seem to track it down in the shop when I need to film it, but basically there's nothing to it. It's just this aluminum plate that is the shape of this section over here, has a bunch of holes drilled into it for two more hinges, these air filters, and I believe there's a, a section for the handle. And that's basically all the kit gives you. And for all intents and purposes, it does the job. In fact, the kit hatch is a perfectly viable foundation in order to add details upon it. And matter of fact, that's what I did on my King Tiger build that I built about 10 years ago. And 
I was thinking about just, you know, rinse washing and repeating that for this build over here, but I came to the conclusion that for this particular build, that probably wouldn't be the best approach. And the reason why I came to that conclusion is with the interior detailing that this model does have. Like I touched upon before, the external portion, you can use that as a base work to polish it up into something that's pretty decent. But one catch or caveat that these components have is that the interior section, it's a bit problematic to try to take the kit one and trying to shoehorn it in order to make it better replicate the real one. This was something that I have touched upon in a few other videos, namely with the Tiger Ones, where if you see any of the other videos on the ECA channel where I detail the engine compartment, I have to take the engine hatch and add several other fittings to the interior section in order to polish it into something that replicates the real one. And on Tiger One, that's relatively easy to do. However, on the King Tiger, and this is the same is true for the Panther, that's just not the case. And in order to take the kit hatch and trying to modify it to better replicate the real one on the inside, it was just more work than to basically make a new one. So that's exactly what I did. And if anyone's curious on what I mean, well, here you can see what I went ahead and developed. And honestly, this part here is one part I'm particular, uh, particularly proud of designing because it took a bit of research and also it was really enjoyable designing this component in CAD, you know, bringing it up to the condition that we have here and also taking advantage of some things that you can do in CAD and in printing that you just can't really do with other manufacturing techniques. So the long and short of it is that this is the new, well, not just this, but also with this runner over here, the new 1-6 scale ECA 3D printed King Tiger engine hatch set. The set comprises of the two main components that we have here. The first and most prominent, of course, is the engine hatch itself, which as you can see, contains all of the external and you will also be seeing the interior fittings integrally printed on as one unit. And the other is this little run over here with the remainder of the detail fittings in order to get this thing fitted in place and also to get the engine compartment, or I should say the engine hatch area, fully fleshed out with more details. Starting with the runner plate takes us to the hinge work. The hinge work you'll see have the appropriate geometry and detailing for a King Tiger hatch. If the camera could get it to focus, you can see the complex shapes that have been rendered in. This is all painstakingly designed from studying lots of real images of the real King Tigers that are still in existence. The hinges have, like I said before, the correct geometry to them, but they also have the subtle details, such as the sunk-in fasteners that are in these two areas over here. And you'll see that on the hinge portion, we have these two small holes that are present, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, these holes are for a lock pin to be inserted into place, and it prevents the main pin from drifting out. The same detailing is found on both hinges, and what's unique is that even though I think only one of these little holes would have a pit, a lock pin fitted in place. The little fitting is found on both of these sections. And again, this is as per the real units I was studying. In addition to what I just mentioned, you can also see the integral weld beads printed in these sections over here, as I've done on the other components that I've already touched upon. From the hinge work takes us to the, oh, one other thing that's also a happy accent are these little step down lines that are found here on the sides of the hinge. This is present from the 3D printing that's used of course to fabricate these parts, but a similar type feature is also found on the real one, so it's also a happy accident. I've seen this on several components that are milled and shaped and just manufactured on the actual unit. So again, it's something that, hey, it works out both ways. Uh, the other thing I want to mention are these three locks that we have here. In order to keep the hatch in place and to prevent from flopping around, obviously this thing weighs a ton in real life, but in order to still fasten it in place, the Germans went ahead and designed the system that we have here where we have these three pivoting locks that are secured on various locations on the engine hatch deck area, and once in place, these will prevent the hatch from flopping around. These components here consist of these three main areas, which have a very unique geometry to them. And also, we have pre-welded bosses, which are mounted to the engine deck itself. And then the actual pivoting pins, which secure everything in place. 
These pieces were originally offered on the catalog for many years in a cast resin format. However, with the units over here, the old cast resin ones have been put out the pasture and are no longer in production and are OOP. In addition to this set, by the way, I also offered just the locks over here as a separate standalone detail upgrade set. So in case you have a Armor Tech or any other make of King Tiger out there and just want to add the surface details, you can do that with just these pieces over here without the extra cost of purchasing the entire hatch. So that is something also to consider. One other thing on the sprue is I also went ahead and designed the hinge pins which can be used to obviously hinge everything together and have them work. I might as well design them in 3D print. You can also obviously replace them with a metal pin if so desired, but you know, I might as well include it because I had the real estate available and why not? So that's it for the actual hinge runner. Now this takes us to the piece of resistance, the hatch itself. So as I mentioned before, the hatch is a single 3D printing. And with this technology, this is something that I've learned while doing several other detail components from the M40 recoilesses to the Jeep trailers and a few other components that I've developed over the years. You can get a ton of detailing with complex geometry with having it be a single printing and this cuts down on the complexity immensely and that is going to be seen on this part here. So on the hatch, not only do we have the hatch itself, we have the hinges that are integrally printed on. The hinges, of course, are the reverse image of these ones here. And on these ones, not only do they have all those features that I touched upon before, but they also have these lugs, or I should say these large triangular wedges that are present. And these act as hatch stops and prevent the hatch from over swinging. Just like with the old ones, they also have their welds integrally printed on. In addition to that, we have the handle integrally printed on as well. It's not some loose piece that you need to glue on. and of course, the well beads are present as well. The last thing that we have here before I touch upon the air intakes are, or I should say, is this tunnel section, which is an iconic bit of detailing found on King Tiger engine hatches. And what this does is this allows you to insert a crowbar into this area over here and gives you extra leverage to open this hatch because as I touched them before, these things are heavy. So the piece does have the correct geometry to it. It has its end plate fitted in place and well beads are present all throughout. The last thing to mention on the exterior are the air intakes and this is something that again I took quite a bit of painstaking time trying to research to develop these parts over here. These parts are as realistic as I can possibly make them. The domes have the correct geometry to them and if we compare that to the original kit supplied one you can clearly see how much more advanced they are in comparison to the original unit supplied with the mom. Not only do they have the geometry that I just mentioned, but on the top side here, we have a cover plate with some spot welds that are present. On the real unit, these are actually two pieces, and with the way they're designed, the two pieces are just done for manufacturing, and then when they're fitted to the vehicle, they are permanently secured in place, and this was a technique that was taken, or I should say perfected, I should say, on the later production German Tiger 1s, but more information on that is in another video, I suppose. Now, that's how it looks like on the outside. Now, let's take a look at the inside. As I touched on before, the kit one originally was just one metal plate, which is two holes in the center for you to secure these in place, which means you're just gonna have a big Allen fastener on the inside and that's all there is to it because again you know the piece doesn't really need to have interior detailing well on this one here it's a little bit different so here goes the big reveal boom so as you can see there's a lot going on on the inside over here and much more than most people would tend to imagine the first thing I want to touch upon are the air intakes as I touched upon before they are hollow so the if I hold the thing up in a certain light you can see that it does not make contact with the floor and it's actually elevated. Well, here you see what it looks like on the inside. On the inside, you can see exactly how this piece would have been manufactured in real life. So we have the air intake, which is comprising of two components. We have the tower and then the dome itself. The tower has these cutouts present and allows air to be sucked into the engine compartment for the engine to you know, cycle. The unit would then be secured in place via some welds found in this area over here. And I believe also fasteners. I'm a little bit hazy on that. It's a bit tricky to 
find in photographs. But in addition to the tower, the dome would then get secured in place via a pin. So on the top portion over here, there's actually a hole and there's a pin that would be secured in place. Once that pin secured in place, they spot weld it shut and the piece is now solid and, it, and it's no longer movable. On the inside portion over here, we can see the tower with all of those cutouts that I mentioned before. We also see the top portion here of the tower where we have that securing pin detailing all present. And again, all the geometry is as close to the real one as I can possibly make it. All of the weld beads are present, as I touched upon before, and also you can see the inset that is present in this section over here. And of course, it's a mirror image on the one on the opposite side. Where the interior portion gets really interesting, though, is with the outer rim and also the edge. So starting with the outer rim, the King Tiger engine hatch has this very unique type of a brace that's found in this area over here. And it's quite similar to what we see like on the side of the Tiger One, where the sponsons are, where we have that wavy, that wavy plate with those rivets in place. Kind of similar idea, only it's just welded directly to the engine hatch. And it's also welded in sections, as you can see on the model here. Of course, all the weld beads are integrally printed on, as I've mentioned numerous times already. And on the real unit, the reason why there's this brace over here is because there is actually a rubber gasket in this section over here and this secures or I should say it creates a seal on the engine deck. Now unlike the earlier Tiger ones where they were able to snorkel the King Tiger did kind of have that capability too at first but it was immediately dumped. However the gasket was still remaining and the gasket detailing is also present here on this component. This is the type of thing that's gonna be way more noticeable after the model is painted, but the way it's modeled over here, you see how that weld bead comes up and it stops right there at that point? Well, from this point onward, this would be the rubber gasket. And if I hold the unit in a certain light, you can see the groove found in this section over here, and that is the rubber gasket. It's basically like the one you see on your refrigerator. In addition to the gasket setup, the most iconic thing that I saw on the King Tiger hatch is with the bevel right here on either side and this was something that was really best done in a fresh 3d print as opposed to trying to you know carve this into the metal on the original so you can see that the engine hatch has a taper to it and basically when it closes on the real unit this would have a mirror image on the hull itself and once it closes down it is going to be a solid type securement point and it basically it's more efficient to do this in a straight wall design it also keeps moisture out it has a lot of benefits to it now on the model i'm not going to be able to have this bevel on the tank itself but at least it's on the engine hatch and this is why this is important because if you open up the engine hatch on the stock kit you're just going to have a flat plate with two fasteners in place to try to replicate this type of detailing on the kit one obviously you can see how much more work that's going to require and the juice isn't really worth the squeeze so that's why I went ahead and, like I mentioned before, went with this option here. But you can also see that once this thing is fully painted and weathered, and when you open it up, it really does improve the model immensely, specifically how much it's going to complement that engine compartment that I mentioned in the earlier videos. Also, because the piece is made out of that white nylon material, the surface texture is going to be excellent, and it doesn't have any of those really rough print lines that you see on a large number of more affordable prints that are out there. This one here, it's basically top of the line, and that's why I like to use this material for my prints. And uh, really, that's all there is to it. So from here, this thing is going to head off into paint, and then once I go ahead, paint, and weather everything, you'll really get to see how these components come alive. So the first parts I'm gonna start assembling are the filler caps. Here you can see what the piece looks like fully assembled or at least mocked up. I still need to add some drops of glue, maybe make a small little modification to the lugs, but basically the piece is filling out pretty nicely. This one over here is in the process of being assembled and basically I just snip the pieces off with my clean cut snips, remove any remembrance with a sharp exacto knife, and then the parts are deburred. So here you get to see exactly how the parts are functional. Once the part gets glued in place, you'll be able to actually use a tool to unlock the unit and lock it as you would on the real vehicle. Right now the piece is not glued in place, so it's just spinning 
aimlessly. But the part disassembles in this manner and there goes the locking lug mechanism underneath. Can't really go into specifics too much about this over here, but basically the piece is a cam type system and when you rotate it one way, it'll lock and when you rotate it the other way, it will move in the opposite direction, freeing the lugs with their clearance so the piece can be fred. On the component here, I might as well get this on film, but I went ahead and removed the part like I touched on before and I also deburred it or in the process of deburring it. And the one thing that I noticed that I have to do is with a pin vise here with a small router bit, but you could use a, a small drill bit with the same type of application. I just go in there and I clean out the areas more thoroughly compared to the way they are now. Not because the tolerances are tight or anything, it's just with the way the pieces are manufactured. This is a powder 3D print and because of that when you have recesses like this they tend to fill up with residual powder. The powder just gets moved very easily by the pin vise. I'm not putting pressure or anything, I'm just putting the unit into the location over here and just spinning and it's just cleaning out the hole. So as you can see the pin vise does really short work of clearing out these cavities. You have to clean these out by the way or else the pieces obviously are not just going to be able to fit in place if there's any sort of obstruction that that's blocking them. Once the unit is cleared out, I'm just going to go ahead and remove this guy here off the sprue and deburr accordingly. With the way the pieces are printed, the parts that you need to cut away are a different diameter compared to the lugs that are used to plug the unit in place, so you know exactly how much material needs to be removed and also removes the chance of of there being a mishap where you cut the whole piece off. And once the unit is deburred, the piece should just drop directly into place once you find the happy sweet spot. Once the piece is all cleaned out, it's then time to free the remaining of the parts and get them assembled like the way I did before. So here are the units fully assembled and are fully functional. Starting with the larger filler, What's unique about this version is that there's a small little retention plate on this section over here and it's obviously would have been welded to the real unit. The ECA one, the piece is a separate printing and obviously has to be done that way because you have to put the fastener in first and then this piece here just gets secured in place and basically this is the job, is the real one. The unit looks like this once it's fully assembled. I believe it is unlocked at the moment so it pops off just like that. In order to use the lock mechanism. I have this little square piece of wood here. I believe this is from a bottle rocket. Yep, it's from a bottle rocket. And it does the job actually pretty well. If I index the piece in place and twist, you can see how the lugs operate. One small change I had to make on the fly was that on the lugs themselves, they are slightly longer than they actually need to be. So with a clean cut snip here, I just made the appropriate adjustments until finally the piece drops in place and secures in place with the locking mechanism. If I loosen this, or I should say unlock it, like that, you can see how the lugs went in. The unit then drops directly into place. At this point here, it's not locked. I rotate that, and now the unit's locked in place. This is what it looks like on the inside. If I go ahead and unlock it, you can see what it looks like. It's kind of hard to get on camera with the stick being as long as it is, but there you go. Okay, so now it's locked. It ain't moving anywhere. Unlock. Piece comes right off. One thing's cool about this version is that there are these two indexing points here on either end, and they lock into that groove that's found right here on the rim. For some reason, that's not present on this version, at least from the real King Tiger that I was studying, so... I'm kind of surprised because it actually works really good with with indexing the part in place and does a good job with keeping it where it needs to be. On the little one here, right now it's in the lock position. As you can see, it moves around a little bit, but this will stiffen up once the paints go in place. But again, the way you see it here is exactly as for the real unit because there's no indexing sections whatsoever found on the part. As for unlocking it, well, it works in much the exact same way. So there is locked. That's unlocked, and it comes right out. Just like with the other version here, this one also needs to be adjusted slightly with the clean cut snip. And again, this was done 
basically on the fly and I just hand fit it until it was I removed just the right amount of material for the piece to turn out just just fine. Uh, I'm not going to make the change to the CAD file because it's really easy to do in practice. You just simply snip the pieces off and the piece then drops directly where it needs to be. Obviously you want to take your time with it make sure you don't over remove the part but as you can see the part works as advertised so that's kind of cool. And as for securing them to the tank, well before I do that here we have the kit original one compared to the ECA one. And you can really see why I went ahead and went through the motions of modifying this component here. Or I should say, designing a new component. As for securing it to the top deck, let me go ahead, grab the panels, so you get to see exactly how they would be installed on the real vehicle. Okay, so with the two top plates present, you can see how the ECA one just drops directly onto the Armor Tech kit without any sorts of modifications needed to be made to either the kit or the ECA piece. Fortunately, with the way the Armor Tech kit is designed, they are size specific, so you can't mix up the two and they will only go into their appropriate location. So this one here will go on this side, and just drops right in, and this one goes on the other. As you can see, absolutely no hand fitting was required and the piece is a simple drop in installation. The piece pops right off and then you can see another benefit of the ECA design where you can see directly inside the hull over here and it's seamless. You don't have the two materials here which would be visible and it just self indexes accordingly so once the piece is off the only gaps that are present are the ones found on the actual detail component. Of course these pieces obviously are designed to work on the armor tech however you can fit these on any 1-6 scale King Tiger variant that's on the market or if you're scratch building one. If you are you can either just you know drill two holes into the back over here with a hole saw or you can just simply amputate these sections of the 3D printing and then just glue it to the surface. Me personally I like the self indexing feature because it does help align things quite a bit. With the 3D printed parts going through their painting procedure it's then time to bounce back to the grill work. The grill work here is going to be used of course on this build but I am going to enhance it further for, compared to what the kit offering gives you. So as I touched upon before, the, the kit piece is a single turning or machining of CNC aluminum. And by the most part, it's great. It has the right shape, it has the right detailing to it, and it fits in place, you know, basically does everything that you want a piece like this to do for you. However, one area where it can be improved upon are with the cut lines here and here. The King Tiger is just like with the Panther and most importantly just like the Tiger 1, where the grill work has this thing where it doesn't fully make contact with the walls on a couple locations and on the King Tiger you can see it over here and over here. Now what's interesting is that the Armor Tech kit does have a little cut line present however it doesn't for one reason or another go all the way through to the bottom. As for why this is the case honestly I have no idea. This has been the case with these Armor Tech pieces now since day one. They only recently started adding the slits here which is nice however I don't see why they can't just go ahead and just straight up mill right through it. I, I just don't know. It's one of those things that is not known to me. However, on my builds, of course, I like to go ahead and add this detailing here, and that can be seen on this example. This one here, you can see that the cut lines have already been added, and you can see just how much more improved it looks compared to the stock original counterpart. One nice thing about the kit one is that although the pieces are not all the way cut through, at least it tells you exactly where you got to make the cut line, so it removes a bit of guesswork and potentially some mishaps that can happen because you can, you know, invert it and that's not really helping anybody. In the past, I've done this procedure one of two ways, either by hand like I'm doing over here with the Dremel or with my mill. The mill does a great job. Unfortunately, the bit that I would need to do this procedure on the mill wore out and I don't have a replacement on hand, so that basically pigeonholes me to doing this by hand. I'm going to be utilizing a Dremel with a cutting stone. Now, I try to do the exact same procedure on the mill with the cutting stone. However, for one reason or another, instead of cutting the disc, just stop moving and the mill was unable to cut the unit with this method but for some reason it works perfectly fine with the Dremel. Go figure. Anyway, in order to cut the piece at the correct thickness, or I should say with the correct amount of material removed, in order to speed the job up I went ahead and doubled up the cutting disc that you see here on the mandrel. 
with the cutting disc doubled up, with one pass I could go ahead and remove the exact amount of material necessary as opposed to the single disc which will cut right through. However, you are going to have to do a secondary cut which can lead to a few more procedures because you're going to have to square it off, you're going to have to polish it down a little bit more. With the Dremel over here, one pass and you're good to go. Which is important because you want to spend as little time as possible cutting this material because this procedure will beat the hell out of your Dremel. My Dremel over here, I've used it for all three examples of the grill so far. It's the last one to do. And I gotta say, after doing one of these grills, the Dremel is quite a bit heated up. So, at most you can do two in one inning, and afterwards you're definitely gonna have trouble holding the thing because the Dremel gets that hot. So, in addition to just potentially burning your hands, because how hot this thing gets, this is definitely going to put a lot of wear and tear on the Dremel, which is something that you may want to prevent or mitigate as much as possible. So, what I recommend doing, either do one at a time, and then you know, make the incisions once the the Dremel work is done. Set the Dremel aside, wait about an hour or so for the temperatures to go down, to which then you could, you know, rinse, wash, and repeat. At most, you can do probably two in one inning, but afterwards, again, it is going to be at a bit of a detrimental usage on the Dremel itself. So this really depends on, on exactly how far you want to go with it. So again, for me, just do one and done. Now on the cutting disc itself, the disc can go pretty deep, however it's not going to be sufficient to cut all the way through in one pass. So what you're going to do is you're going to cut the first section here on the outer section as far down as it will go with the Dremel. Then you're going to flip it over and continue the cut on the opposite side. Fortunately the back portion over here acts as a good rest and it actually steadies the cutting disc preventing it from over cutting and that's the biggest thing you have to worry about is removing too much material on either end. Fortunately because these pieces are cast in real life you do have some leeway because the German castings which I'm going to touch upon afterwards is a bit on the cruder side and because of that having the pieces cut in a way that's a little bit more uh, hand cut I should say is definitely something that can more than pass for the real unit. So I'm going to go ahead and start the cutting on this. I'm not going to get that on video. It's nothing really much to show. Let's go ahead and cut across to when this is completed, and we're going to go through the next step. So with the cutouts out of the way, the next thing to do is to add the cast texturing, and this is something that I don't really see other people do on their builds, but it's something that's actually pretty important. One thing that a lot of people don't seem to think about on these German tanks is that these pieces here on the Tiger, Panther, King Tiger, Jag Panther, so on and so forth, are actually made from metal castings. And the castings are, well, rather quite poor and rough if anyone has ever seen them in person. You know, these German tanks, they have the stigma of being, you know, technologically superior and they're excellent. And honestly, that couldn't be any further from the truth, specifically in terms of casting. The Germans really weren't that good at casting parts. They were basically just marginally better than the Russians who definitely take the cake on you know, poor quality castings. Uh, it said that the best castings were actually done by the United States. We had a lot of experience in that. But back to the King Tiger here, why that's relevant is that if anyone's ever seen a real King Tiger in person or a Panther in person, if you look between the grills here, you will see some cast texturing. And that's because, again, these are casted in sand. And in order to get the texturing in place, when it's done, you will have something similar to this. Of course, these are still going through their their procedure, but you can see just how improved they look by adding that texturing there on the inside. And the way to add them on these 1-6 scale models is actually pretty easy. It's more or less done as you were a kid when you used to do stuff in arts and crafts with glitter. It's basically the same concept. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take paint, this here is just my exterior latex that I use for my base coat, and I'm going to paint the inner wells here of the grill work. Once the paint is applied, I then go ahead, put the item in a bucket, throw some sand on the inside, sh stir it, shake it up a little bit, and then once I lift it out, all the extra sand falls out, leaving the surfaces here that were painted encrusted with the sand. As soon as the paint dries, I then add a couple other uh, additives to it to make sure everything is held on in a permanent manner. But Back to what we have here, I'm just going to take this paintbrush and start applying the paint. I personally like to apply it on the inside, it doesn't really matter per se. It's going to be a 
bit of a messy job. You are going to get some drips out of it, but this is something that's going to be addressed after the paintwork is solidified. So, I'm just going to go in here. Make sure that the pieces are covered in a liberal amount, but long as it's on in a thorough manner is really what you're looking for. You don't want to have any spotchy areas because then this will cause the stuff not to stick that well and will really not really do you any favors in the long term. This same procedure, by the way, I've also mentioned on a few other of these Armor Tech builds, namely Tiger Ones and such. And again, it's one of those details that almost everyone out there misses, so. Okay, so as you can see, the paint has been applied. And from here, I'm gonna go ahead, put it in this bucket, and I'm gonna pour the sand in. Sand is actually well-trained ballast, or it's stuff that's used for dioramas. It's some pretty fine stuff. You could use just standard you know, beach sand or, you know, cement sand. Really, just any sand will do. I like using this stuff, though, because it's much more finer. And the other stuff will get you the same result, but it's much more coarse in its final outcome. And from what I've seen, I have actually seen examples of both, where some are coarse and some are fine. So, you know, it depends on your personal... So, once the stuff is in there, like that, you make sure it's all thoroughly coated. Then when you take it out, you will get the look that you see here. Once the paint is fully set, the grill will have this type of appearance to it. In order to refine it further, like you see what I did to this one over here, you need to just go ahead and do some mild polishing to the areas that the paint is found on. This is easily done with just some mild sandpaper. This one here is 100 grit and basically I just take the sandpaper, lay it down flat, and I go over it a few passes and as you can see it makes real short work of the extra clunk that's on the surface. For the clunk here on the top you could still use the sandpaper of course but another thing you could do is just with a razor blade like I have over here just go over these surfaces and again you'll see how it cleans up quite quickly. Once the surfaces are cleaned up you can really get to appreciate the transformation of the part and again it just gives the grills all that much more extra dimension in detailing and also a little bit more accuracy. At this point the paint is the only thing that's keeping the grit onto the areas over here. And if you want to make the units more durable, you can add some extra additives to the surfaces in order to make them stick to the metal in a more efficient manner. One way to do that is take some thin super glue and you basically just drizzle it all over the section over here. Once the stuff dries, it's going to give a pretty good bond. However, it is going to require a little bit of extra cleanup with basically the same techniques that I just showed. But that is one way to do it. Another way is to just simply paint over the units over here with several layers of primer and also eventually the base coat. That too will have the same effect of giving a little bit more robustness to the applied sandy surfaces. With the square grills out of the way, the next thing to turn my attention to are the fan grills. Fan grills, as I mentioned before, are more or less pretty good and ready to go out of the box. The only thing I'm adding to them are the cast texturing, like you can see it has been applied to this one over here, and the mesh work, which is something I am going to be adding momentarily. As for the texturing itself, it's done in the tried and true ECA method, which has been mentioned numerous times on this channel and I even have a few videos where I give a tutorial on how I actually accomplish the look that you see here. The link of course to that video can be found in the video description which by the way I gotta say is pretty cool because it seems like you people out there are paying attention and are watching my videos because I have seen over the last several months or so an explosion in people using this technique on their build so it is something that's pretty cool to see when you know I'm just on Facebook or on the internet and I encounter someone using my technique. Once the outer 
cast texturing is added. I'm going to be adding inner cast texturing as well for the same reasons I, that I touched upon with the other grill work. Then this is going to be done in the exact same format with the exact same technique. So no point get that on camera. Let's go ahead and jump to when these guys are going to get the next level of detailing. With the sand texture added to the inner sections, you can see just how much more evolved the piece is compared to the way it looked first originally with the kit. So the next and last thing I need to do is to add the top guard to it. And if anyone has ever built any of the 135s, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Although on the smaller scale models that are out there, the piece is a bit misleading and that's done for just ease of manufacture for those smaller scales. However, in one six scale, it needs to be done in a slightly different manner. So here we have one of the units where detail wise it's complete. The only thing I need to do is add some sculpted welds around the circumference here of the of the guard, but you really get an idea of exactly what I'm referring to. So on the real King Tigers, and again, same is true for the Panther, the way these round fan guards are fabricated are in this format, where we have a bar stock that is bent around a shape the size of the guard itself, and then we have just some chicken wire that is just looped around and crimped around the end, and then that whole piece is then just welded directly to the cast fan guard like you see here. It looks a bit on the cruder end, but again, this is as per the real vehicle. So this is as basically as close to realistic as you can possibly get with something like this. So in order to fabricate this part here, what I went ahead and did was I pre-prepped these components. The ring itself is made out of 332nd brass bar stock that I went ahead and bent to the shape, which is basically where it needs to be for the fan guard. And for the wire, or I should say the mesh, I'm using varmint mesh. This is aluminum varmint mesh. You can find it in any home improvement store. And this is the same mesh that I use on basically all of my 1-6 scale models. It's really cheap. I picked it up. Uh, almost like 10 years ago now and I still have a ton of it left so it just shows you just how much you can buy for little money. So anyway the next thing to do is to cut it to shape and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the ring place it right here in the in the center and you need to have about a quarter or yeah about a quarter of an inch of mesh around the area where the ring is going to be. What you can do is you can just take a sharpie and just go around the end or like a broad tip sharpie specifically, so then you know exactly the parameters to cut. Once you have the piece cut to shape, it's then time to crimp it over the brass and forming the actual guard itself. And here's the unit cut to shape. I went ahead and did it freehand because you know I already have the muscle memory how to do it, but if you're cautious, you could use the sharpie just to you know double check. Fortunately, this stuff is so abundant that if you screw it up, you know, you could always give it another shot. Anyway, the next thing to do is to bend it over the brass and crimp it in place. And this is really just done with your fingers. You're going to take it and you're going to bend it over. And then with your fingertips, you're actually going to press inward. You can try using a plier for this. And I have done that in the past, but honestly, the fingers work probably just as good, if not better than the actual tool does. But you know, your mileage may vary. So let me go ahead and start with the crimping. It's a little tricky to get on camera with the tripod over here, but I should be able to muscle through. So basically what you got to do is you need to first loop it over. And this is the trickiest part because you need to have a basically like an anchor point. And there you go. There's the first corner in place. And then once the first corner is bent in place, the rest should just follow suit. Fortunately, this mesh here is very, very flexible and it's very easy to use. There are some other mesh out there, like the ones for windows, for instance, which are made out of aluminum. Those are a bit stiffer and are much more trickier to bend compared to this type of material here. So let's cut across to where the prelim is already done and I'm about to do the, the actual crimping. Okay, so the piece is now crimped over, but it's just loosely crimped on and you really need to press the edges in just so it stays in place in a much more 
sturdier manner and also make the installation a bit easier too. Now to do this, like I said before, I like to use my fingers and it's kind of similar to what you see people doing with pies. It's the best analogy I can, I can muster. You bend it over and you basically with your fingernail here, you're going to be pushing in and this is going to have the effect of taking the wire and wrapping it around the brass rod, which is what you want. Now you don't have to be super perfect with it, but you just want to have it crimped in a certain way. Hopefully it should come out, oops, hopefully it should come out on camera with my knuckles not just hogging up all of the, the view. But you just work around and you're just pinching and crimping, it's all you're doing. There may be a couple little strands running around loose like that guy over there. I'll touch upon that momentarily. And that should pretty much do it. Okay, so the crimping is done. Now if there are a couple little strands here or there that are a problem, you could simply just snip them away with a pair of clippers or snips and which would clean up the area a little bit. Once that's done, you then super glue or epoxy or whatever, well, don't use, uh, uh, what the hell is that stuff? JB Weld, it's honestly overrated garbage, but use some kind of adhesive of your choice to cement or adhere this section to the grill cover. Once the adhesives are set, it's then gonna be time to sculpt on the weld beads. The weld beads are going to do two things. First, they're going to give you the appropriate detailing of the welds, which would be on the real unit, and they also act as a little extra support and structure to keep the unit in place. The welds aren't in an, a particular pattern or anything. Like I've seen on the real ones, it's actually pretty just like, just tacked weld on there. It's just like... Pfft in a few locations here or there so there's no real like definitive way or well pattern to speak of just basically wing it is the best approach i can have and you'll know exactly how to do it or like how they did it on the real ones so from here i'm going to go ahead and cut across to when well these guys here are fully painted along with the other guards themselves of course, once everything is covered in a mono coat of primer, it just makes everything look so much cleaner. So at this point here, all of the detail mods have been made, and at this point they're actually ready for installation. Before I install them though, I probably am going to go ahead and paint them with the base coat of Dunkel Gelb, just so I can make sure that all areas are thoroughly coated with the base coat. One thing that is always commonplace on these type of grills, and this is true for basically all scales from 135 to 16, is that because of the elaborate geometry found on these sections over here, they tend to have this knack of not getting paint in the certain locations and this is something that I definitely want to take care of so while the pieces are off this does lend themselves to be easily painted at this time but I might as well go ahead and get them on camera before they go ahead and enter into that final phase so here we have the main square grills and there's the cast texture now over painted which again acts as a way to get paint on the surfaces of course but also it adds as an extra adhesive in a way i also went ahead and off camera added some more cast texturing to the surface areas over here this was done to again help with the continuity of the part the way i added the cast texturing on these was with a slightly different method where i take a really stiff bristle paintbrush and i took just some of the dunkel gelb that i use and i just blotched it on and splotched it on in onto these smooth areas on the top once it dries it gives you this type of an appearance there is some grit from the sand that i added before it must have got stuck on the brush during the application but you know actually it helps out in the long run this technique does work it tends to be a little bit smoother compared to some of the other techniques that i mentioned but again it's nice to have a few other techniques under your belt as opposed to just doing everything in the same format on the main fan grills you can see what they look like now fully completed as I touched upon before, sculpted well beads were applied and 
these areas over here. And also, as I mentioned earlier, there's no real set pattern in how you apply the welds. It's just basically how would you know you do it if you were actually welding them in place. And if it was me, I would weld them in the following format. One thing that's really cool about these units is that once they are completed, they have this very realistic look to them where this is not something that you can mimic if the whole piece was made out of standard photo etch. Again, for the smaller scale builds, it works perfectly fine, but this is the type of thing that you really do appreciate more on a 1-6 scale model as opposed to something done in a smaller scale. Normally, the PE is just flat and laid right across the top of the grill. does the job just fine, but on the real unit, there's a space between the grill mesh cover and the metal grill housing underneath. And this little gap over here just looks so much better when modeled in this format as opposed to the other method that most people tend to mimic on their own builds. And after a few minutes of painting and weathering time, this is what the final end result of the engine hatch looks like. So. Here you can see all those details I touched upon before, but they really come out much more once everything is fully painted and of course once the weathering is applied. In addition to the weathering, you can also see the rubber strip that I was talking about before. And then once it's been painted to replicate, well, rubber, it really has a very realistic effect to it. And it really does make this intersection of the component just pop right out. Obviously, to install it in place is done via the two pins that we have right here. And I already have the hinges installed onto the rear deck that I'll touch upon in a moment. And so far from what I've seen, the 3D printed hinges, or I should say the hinge pins work absolutely perfectly. However, if anyone wants to replace them for one reason or another with metal ones, this of course is something that can be done as well. And of course, everything comes down to what we have right here. The engine hatch, along with all the other provisions that I mentioned earlier in the video, have been fitted to the vehicle at this time. And with the components fitted, you really get to see how they would operate. So starting with the engine hatch, the hatch has been fitted to the top deck. The pins have been mounted in their place and the hatch is actually fully functional at this point. However, one thing that you may be wondering is, is, John, how do you keep this thing from flopping around when the tank is in operation? Of course, a hatch needs to have some kind of a retention system. Otherwise, you can't just rely on gravity alone or else this thing is going to flop around on you. And the answer is yes, you are absolutely correct. The design the Germans came up with was actually rather simple for the Germans, but was one that was a great design nonetheless. And that design consists of these three lugs that we have here. I touched upon these earlier in the video where they were attached to the sprue, but here you get to see what they look like attached to the vehicle and at this point are fully functional. So the components consist of these three leg, or lugs that you see here. And these are secured onto welded bosses that are held in place then with a large fastener. The way they work on the real vehicle is when they are in this position here, they prevent the hatch from opening and the hatch is locked. And true to form, as you can see here, the piece is fully non-functional. Then when you need to access the engine or open up the hatch for one reason or another, you simply just pivot these out of the way. And once they are out of the way, you can now open up the engine hatch without any sort of problems. As you can see, the hatch moves absolutely freely without any sort of hangups or any other problems whatsoever. The hatch is also considerably lighter compared to the original Armor Tech unit, which puts less wear and tear on the area as a whole. And actually, really good news, just now I was able to see where I set the original Armor Tech kit supplied hatch and hinges aside, and here is what they look like in comparison to the ECA one. Here's the hatch here. As I touched upon before, it is nothing more than just a cutout panel of aluminum alloy plate. And the hinges are these components that we have right here, which are again just CNC'd aluminum hinges that have the basic overall look and shape of the King Tiger hinge. Now, if we compare that to the one on the armor, or I should say on the ECA set, here you can really get an idea of exactly what type of an upgrade the ECA set does to the stock Armortech kit. 
And with the camera readjusted, this should definitely put things into focus. Now, as I touched upon before, it is possible to take these hinges here and to modify them so that they visually look like the counterpart that we have next to them. In fact, that's exactly what I did on my personal King Tiger model. However, you know, <laughs> it does save you a lot of time and effort to just roll with the 3D printed counterpart. Same is also true for the hatch, only with the hatch, the outside can, you know, mimic the detailing that we have here. However, it's where the interior section comes into play, is where trying to modify this to make it better replicate the real unit is where things become problematic. So there's the 3D printed counterpart compared to the ArmorTech kit original. So is it technically possible to modify this to make it look like this one here? Uh, technically, yes, it, it is, only, you know, it's going to take you a bit of machining and also a bit of time to do that. Also, I just want to point out, in case anyone does want to add the surface detailing that we have here, there is a set offered on the ECA catalog, which is just the blower details that are present on this printing. Those are intended for you to modify the kit one if the individual so deems fit. That set is a lower cost alternative compared to rolling with the full 3D printed hatch. And that's something more or less intended for someone that just wants to keep the exterior detailing and the interior is not really that important. If that's going to be the type of build that you're going to focus on, perhaps that detail set there is something that can be beneficial for your build. But keep in mind, you are still going to have to have some tooling in order to drill out these sections over here to have these units plugged directly in place. This can be done on a drill press, and if you have a hole saw, the operation is one that is viable. However, it is one that will require some significant tooling to pull off. But again, if this is something that really more or less appeals to your needs, then that set would be for you. So aside from the engine hatch, we now move towards those lift hooks that I touched upon before. And I was mistaken what I said earlier when I mentioned that the kit does not supply you with these pieces. The kit actually does. However, they are very basic in their shape and they're made from thick pieces of laser cut steel. They do go into these holes that are pre-drilled into this deck over here. However, to replace them with the ECA ones, the only thing that needs to be done is you just enlarge the holes where the original kit ones would have went as intended. This is done on a drill press with a slightly bigger drill bit, I believe an eighth of an inch if I'm not mistaken, and once done, the new units will just drop directly into place as you see here. Once in place, you can see how they really flesh out the detailing in this section over here, complete with their sculpted on, or I should say integrally printed on weld beads. And on the topic with the hooks, you can see those smaller hooks that I mentioned earlier fitted in place onto the fan sections. These are very easily installed and again are marked with a pencil and then the holes are drilled out with a drill press. Once the holes are in the appropriate location, the pieces just drop directly into place. However, one thing that I do need to mention is that I made a mistake when I did the number count on these parts over here where I was actually one short and that's because I was counting these parts for a panther and not the king tiger where on the king tiger all these plates have four of these hooks here while on a panther there's a set of three. So that is something I'm going to make a change to to the production units and this will be seen on the actual production sets. For this set over here I did have the hole drilled in place and I have a replacement piece in production right now. Once it comes out just to simply drop it into place and that will complete the detailing for that part over there. However on this unit over here you can see what it looks like fully flushed out. On that note you can see the fan cards mounted in place and the texture should be something that is noteworthy. And you can see the other grills temporarily mounted in place here along with that this rear metal strip. This is something that is kit supply. It's made from quarter of an inch aluminum alloy plate and it'll just simply fasten to this section over here once the unit is ready for installation. However, this is something I am going to be revisiting in the next video update. Carry on back to the center takes us to the filler cover caps. At the moment, they are not lo locked in the closed position, but here you have to see the cap detailing found on the inside. Of 
course, if I had a little square wrench right now, I could go ahead and lock them closed, but at the moment I do not have one in the shop. That is something I need to <laughs> bring up from the other shop, but that's neither here nor there. On the other air vent, this is that cover that I was talking about before. Here you get to see what it looks like with the bodywork that has been done to it. And by bodywork, I mean I went ahead and added some super glue to the surface over here and I polished it down with some sandpaper. This was done because of the different type of printing technique that was used on this piece here, as opposed to the other SLS components that are found on the sets, as I may or may not have mentioned earlier. At the moment, this component is not permanently secured on at this time because I need longer fasteners compared to the ones that were originally intended for this piece with this with the kit. And at the moment, I have a bit of a fastener shortage, so I have a a resupply on route from the supplier. Once they cook, once they come in, I should say, I should be able to just simply bolt this guy into place with no other work being necessary. But at this time here, you can get to appreciate the mesh work that I added earlier. And you'll notice that I primed the inside here with the base coat of Dunkel Gel because obviously once the unit is fitting in place, yeah, you're not exactly gonna be able to get the paint into all those locations. So it's best to take care of that at this point here. Back to the remainder of the rear plate detailing, you can see that there are a bunch of fasteners that are added to these locations. These are the kit original fasteners and went on without any sort of problems. One thing that's neat about the King Tiger is that there are these sunken, recessed fasteners in these areas and the kit supplies you with a set of Allen fasteners, which do a pretty good job with replicating this detail. However, I believe on the real King Tiger, if I'm not mistaken, I believe these may be square stud type fasteners, which are found, like for instance, on the grill area on the Tiger 1. However, for the model over here, the Allen cap screws do the job just fine, and they secured in place in the correct kit locations. The holes all lined up appropriately and you just fasten them on with a little bit of Loctite and basically you're good to go. Of course that, or I should say these fasteners here are really important because they secure this bottom lip to the aluminum alloy plate which gives you that inner lip that we have there and also it's what allows you to secure this section to the top deck, which is something I'm going to be touching upon momentarily. In this area over here you'll notice that I have bits of detailing left to add. There's this triangular plate found in this section over here. I'm not really sure what it's for, but it is a staple found on the King Tiger in this area over here. And this over here is the antenna base well, which is a bit of detailing I'm going to be adding in the next video update, so stay tuned for that. In addition to that, there's some other equipment found in these two areas, including the SNP and also the Tetra fire extinguisher. Again, I have these components on hand. I just need to go ahead and get them fitted in place. The next bit of noteworthy detailing to mention are the grenade cover grills that are found on the square grill covers. As you can see, I have the frames in place. They are not fastened at this time because I need to figure out a way to secure them to the rear area over here, but not secure them to the hull via the fasteners. What I mean by that is the whole rear plate here does still need to be removable in case there's a emergency and you need to get access to the inner confines in this section over here. With the way the Armor Tech kit is designed, they are meant to permanently secure these sections into their appropriate locations and once they are fitted in place, your, the access is no longer a feature that you have. Also, another reason why I kind of need to make the plate removable or semi-removable is because once you mount those interior details like I did here, trying to get access to put those fasteners in place via the nuts underneath is going to be a fool's errand. And that is something that is no longer gonna be feasibly done. So I fortunately, I do have a design solution in my head on how to take care of this, but I am going to need some special fasteners for that that are en route. And there's some modification I need to make to a few of these pieces, which I'll be going over in more depth in the next video update. In addition to that mention, here you can also see the 3D printed breather valves temporarily positioned in place. And this basically gives you an idea on how they get fitted to the vehicle. Now with the King Tiger, I believe, I gotta brush up on my research about this, but there were two options of the breather valves. You had an earlier version that I believe had two breather valves and then a later version that had four or I believe it's vice versa if I'm not mistaken. Again, don't uh, don't hold me to that. I'm still uh, brushing up on my King Tiger uh, minutia. But regardless, here you get to see what the 3D printed parts would look like once fitted to the deck. 
The pieces will just drop directly into these locations over here, and then there are some plumbing that needs to be affixed to them. But again, this more of this is going to be discussed in the next video update. Along with that, there are other grenade grills that go into these areas over here that have this elaborate frame type setup. And again, this is something that I needed to design after I kind of have everything temporarily fitted in place over here so I could go ahead and make sure that I have the proper proportions because nothing sucks more than spending time researching, developing something, only to have it printed, comes in, and then, oop, it's, you know, the wrong size for one reason or another. So now that I have this area over here, I can quickly go ahead and finish the CAD work up. I already have three quarters of it designed, but again, I just needed to double check my bases, which I can do right now. So that's something that's going to be mentioned in the next video or two updates. Fortunately, those are not important enough where I can't get the tank into paint. So those are something I could add even after the whole rear deck area here is painted. On that, the rear section over here is got it, or does need to be semi-removable because I need to mask up the interior portion over here because it would be really anticlimactic to go through all this work trying to get the interior section, you know, detailed and painted out, only to have it oversprayed with layers of Dunkel Gel. That that's something that would really, really suck. So this is something that I am going to be revisiting as the project winds down, which it definitely most certainly is. But as you can see at this point over here, outside those small little details that I need to flesh out, the rear deck area is basically coming to an end. I mean, this was the last open area on the build that needed to have been sealed up for the model to progress further, and it's now one giant step closer to painting. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for this 1-6 scale ArmorTech German King Tiger heavy tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 1-6 scale project update videos like this one over here, or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new post content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted since the project start, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been mentioned on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.